My name is Enrique Cardenhes, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, treating problems like nails. Um, but before I begin on the talk, just a bit about myself, some background. So I grew up in Kempton Park, uh, where I had my very first uh, phone. And to pay homage to this phone, a nice cheesy animation, bad cropping, and 3310. That phone was a, a solid phone. Lost the phone a year later, got stolen, but that doesn't really matter. It served me well during this time. Um, afterwards, moved to Pretoria, studied at the University of Pretoria, uh, BSc Computer Science, and uh, finished my honours there and started work. On, during my first year of work, got myself a car. Uh, don't let the size deceive you, it is a pretty small car. Can't fit much in the boot. But um, I actually wanted to make a, a bad pun about Nokia and Kia, but, but I'm not going to go there. So I've been programming for just over eight years. I work at Intellect right now as a senior software engineer, also the project lead there on the team. Uh, started off in Java, uh, transitioned over to C Sharp, um, but I don't think the, the language really defines what you are. It's just a current state. Um, I enjoy coding in Python in my off time, and I enjoy uh, a kind of alternative genre of music, kind of dark, kind of heavy. So on, on to the talk itself. Uh, this talk isn't going to be an in-depth technical talk, although I will be actually covering quite a few technical concepts, but at a high-level overview. So this talk is about manicures. Like, like you said, no, not quite. It's about nails. Yes, those are nails. Or not. <laughs> so so the, the idea behind the talk is that um, there's an old phrase that says, when all you have is a hammer, you treat everything like a nail. And it talks about um, a bias that we sometimes have where when we get quite familiar with a tool, we end up using it uh, for more than it's needed. What ends up happening is something similar to this, uh, where you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> um, this, this speaks about two situations. You've got the wrong tool um, for a certain problem, or you're given the wrong tools to solve problems you know how to solve. But this talk's talk, uh, going to focus on the former. So the first topic or tool I want to talk about is closures. So what are closures? Uh, just to take you through a short example, if I were to write a closure, uh, maybe not a very elegant one, here's an exponent. Uh, it takes in a base, returns a function, arrow function, and over here, from there to there, that's actually where I'm creating the closure at that point. I can then say exponent of 2, which gives me a power 2 function or a square function, and call it with 8, call it with 32 to get those squared. Um, you don't actually have to keep calling it with two or store in a variable, you can just call it and execute it twice. So closures have been around for uh, 50, about 55 years, and their main purpose is to capture lexical scope. Uh, every t whenever you return a function from another function, that's actually when you're creating the closure itself. And all the variables you have inside that function, that's the private state that nothing else can access. So they've got a bit of downsides. Um, I'll take you through some examples of these. Uh, referencing an unbound variable, which I'll talk about just now. Also referencing a bound variable and you get an unexpected result. And the last one, which is an important one, is there's sometimes memory leaks. So in C Sharp, uh, for example, if you have two closures in the same uh, method, uh, what happens is you actually get a backing class created for those closures with everything that they're trying to access, regardless of the same stuff has been accessed in either closure. So you could have the situation where you've, your first closure accesses a really large list or list with large amounts of items. It goes out of scope, but that actually doesn't get deallocated until the second closure that had nothing to do with that list goes out of scope. So if I were to maybe try do closures in JavaScript uh, the bad way, I would go and have a list of actions, or an array, push in some actions just to print out the console log with the value of i, 
and loop through each of the actions to print it out. So as some of you might uh, notice, this isn't, isn't going to work as expected. So what's happening here is actually referencing a bound variable, but you think it's bound and it wasn't really bound. The output of this is actually just 333 instead of your expected 0, 1, 2. Uh, what happens here is that you, by using the var keyword, you're saying i is functional scope, and a quick fix here is just to use the let keyword. Uh, another example um, would be, let's say I make a countdown object literal. And inside it, I've got the count up uh, with a bunch of numbers. Then I've got some various styles for ticking down. Uh, then the print it out to the console log, and you've got tick three, two, and undefined of uh, pop. Cannot be called an undefined. So what happened here is that I actually used the arrow function, which captures key, uh, the scope, and it always captures the functional scope. Since this was not declared in a function, just an object literal, it's actually capturing window. So this is the reference to an unbound variable, and, you, and count up doesn't exist in window, it only exists in inside countdown. Um, times you would actually use closures is when you want to uh, capture the state, and you don't want to have worry about creating a full object and passing it along. The next tool I want to talk about is generics. So generics have been around for a long time, um, about 21 years in Java, actually. But let me just take you through an example of how things looked before generics came about. So you had a list, um, and you would just declare a list. You'd go add strings to this list, and you'd get the items out. Um, before generics is existed, anything you put in the list and got out would be objects. So you'd have to cast the objects to a certain type to know what it is. The downside of this was if you were to cast it to an integer and it was a string, you wouldn't know about this until the code ran at that point. Um, on came the idea of generics, and you have a list of strings. And you can only add strings on it, and you can only get strings out of it. If you cast it to an integer, at the compile time, you, you know it's going to fail, and you don't, your code doesn't work. So the idea behind generics is it's a clean way to maximize your reusability of code without worrying about the type specifically. You can just use the type provided when this code is called to, to work on it. It's mainly used in collection-like classes, uh, list, set, and map. And it, as I said, it provides the compile time safety. But careful to note, it's only compile time safety. So one downside of that is the type erasure. After it's compiled in Java specifically, you don't have access to the original type anymore. Once you use, when coding, you've got a list of strings. After you've compiled, you've just got a list. It gives you the nice option of wildcard, uh, type wildcards with the question mark inside the angle brackets. And that says you don't actually care about the type. You're not going to use the type. Let whatever was in there maintain its type and just return that type without worrying. Um, you've also got the diamond operator that came around in Java 7. Um, that means I can make an array list without specifying string again, and that was a huge benefit. Uh, one other downside is the idea of boxing and unboxing, uh, specifically in Java. Um, it's something to be aware of. You don't actually get too much of a performance hit, uh, but take note. So boxing and unboxing, you can't just go make a list of ints. You have to make a list of integers. Uh, you can make a list for Dracula of wildcard. The problem here is that once this list is created, you don't care about the type, so the only thing that you can insert into this list is nulls. So null is the only thing compatible with all object types. Then you've got the, the type erasure that you might have forgotten about, where you've got a print list that will print strings, a print list that will print lists of integers, um, but this won't compile, fortunately, uh, because it will be an ambiguous method since they both are just lists or methods that take in a list. Uh, good use cases for generics is when you want to get the type out. So when you interact with the database, you don't know what the type is, so you 
give uh, Entity Manager, for instance, the type and it will give that back to you. So when you query um, that DB set, you will always get the type back from there. It might break if the database is bad, badly structured, but it's good to do. Inheritance is another tool. Uh, sometimes often misused tool. Quick example, uh, there's a toy class, and the toy class has a bunch of methods that you can't see here, and one of them is a catchphrase. Catchphrase is the only one that actually needs to be implemented. Play, jump, and roll over um, aren't there. And each toy can just implement that uh, abstract toy class or the main toy class and override its individual catchphrase. So I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure all of you are quite familiar with inheritance. Uh, there's a few problems that arise sometimes using inheritance. So there's a diamond problem, the classical diamond problem. Um, maybe show of hands, who knows about it? Cool, most of the people. I'll take you through a quick example. Um, you have a shape class. From the shape class, you've got a square and a circle. Square and circle have paint methods. Uh, the shape doesn't. Then you go and implement from square and circle, giving you a squircle, and you don't override the paint. What happens? Nothing. The compiler doesn't actually know which paint method to use. Um, then you've also got another problem, which is called the yo-yo problem, and that is heavily prominent in OO, specifically all lasagna code. I'm sure you've all been familiar with it. You've got 20 layers of implementation, and to figure out what's happening at layer 18, you have to read through all the other classes just to infer what occurred there. Um, then lastly, you've got a, the fragile base class problem. This one was actually new to me, so I thought I'd take you through an example just to show you what it's about. Let's say I've got a scorekeeper. Uh, player A and B, they have their own scores, and scorekeeper has a way to increment those scores, and with the draw, he'll just increment both scores. Then I decide I want to reuse this functionality and um, display some text for it, so I create a noisy scorekeeper. Goes and implements each of the methods, and says, uh, for example, when, play, when there's a draw, both players scored. Then another developer comes along and sees this class and decides, oh, he's going to make some optimizations. They're player A++ and player B++. They both uh, are being actually done with the score method. So he'll go make an innocuous change and just call score for A and score for B inside the draw. This passes the unit tests for the scorekeeper class. It actually provides the same original functionality, but suddenly the noisy scorekeeper is broken. What happens is when noisy scorekeeper calls draw, it will say player A scored, player B scored, and then both players scored, which is actually the wrong result. And this is the case of where you can make changes to a base class used in many other places, and it breaks down the line for unexpected reasons. Here is a messy diagram. Um, I'm, I'm using the word inheritance lightly here because most of these are interfaces. And this does run in production some way. Uh, it's maybe an example of bad use of implementation and bad use of generics, both together. So let's say there was a, a service bus or message queue, and you would add songs to this, uh, to this queue. Then you'd have a processor, song message processor, reading items off the queue and doing something with it, ignoring the message or adding it to the playlist. And you've got a parser. So here's a parser to figure out what's in the song. And it says a uh, generic parser of type T, but it's going to parse the XML and return the type T that came back. Problem here was even though this parser was nicely uh, modu modular or swappable, uh, it said parse XML in the name, so as soon as JSON got added, the thing didn't really work. Or it worked, but the, the method name was just absolutely wrong. Then you had a message processor interface, and the idea behind interfaces is a contract of what should be done. So this thing only had one contract, which said process the message. 
but every processor that actually overrode or implemented this interface had inside it private methods called body parser, lookup and process, and rules processor. And these were also used quite strangely, uh, at least to me. So the, proce the process uh, method would look up a certain type of message. The rules would look up the rules, and then those would be passed back into the original process again to be applied. Yeah, this is probably a very good and bad example of not, not doing a row right. Another topic is functional programming. Functional programming also has been around. I'm not sure if any of you Java devs out there have tried it. Yeah, I see a few nods. So then this code shouldn't look, oh sorry, shouldn't look too bizarre to you. So here's a simple example of writing a functional method in Java. T calculate the inflation, taking the price and CPI, your get years, which is an integer, and your return a double, which is a price. So after 14 years and 6% CPI, we have a, uh, the price of milk after 14 years as well. Functional programming comes from the idea of mathematics, calculus, and it's a way to reason about your methods that you're writing or your functions from, from a mathematical point of view and know what's going to happen. It embraces the idea of not mutating any state. So state mutations are side effects um, when objects outside this method call are modified. It also embraces the idea of pure functions, so anything passed in shouldn't be modified itself, and you should return a new object or a new state um, without modifying internal state. The downsides of functional programming is that because it's so against modifying state, you end up having to simulate state just to write to the disk or write to the console. Sometimes people have problems or issues with the efficiency. We're creating new objects every time and um, loading up the memory, but it's, it's got its time and place. And the other downside might be the code and cell. So since you, you're familiar with functional programming in Java, that's good, but other people that come and look at this might not know what on earth is happening. Here's an example of maybe implementing a functional method with JavaScript. Yeah, you've got the imperial system, which is a bit hard for me to understand growing up in South Africa. Um, we take in an imperialist, log it to the console, update its weight, height, and thermometer readings just to be able to read them and return it. And now we know what Mr. Jack is. The problem here is that by writing to the console, I've actually mutated state already which is a no-no. By modifying imperialist, I've ma mutated state again on the object passed in. So if I call map to metric for Mr. Jack, he's just gonna stretch himself out and get thinner. And this, this was just a bad implementation. But it's got its use cases. So if you're programming um, or working at an insurance company and you need to write a calculation engine, functional programming is excellent. Um, working with numbers, returning numbers, it, it works so smoothly, and you don't have to worry about things failing on certain use cases, because since it doesn't modify state, you get the same result every time. Functional programming is also useful with reactive programming, and I'll get into an example of where that is. Um, reactive programming is another paradigm, fairly new for some, but it's actually been around for 39 years. It is the opposite of an enumerable, where you pull things. It's the observer pattern, or pretty much an implementation of the observer pattern, where you push things. So um, these things that you push are events that happen over time. And all these events get pushed onto a stream that you can then use and handle um, as you desire. So to take you through a small example, let's say here's a stream. And this stream over here has a bunch of events on it. Those events are a user typing on a keyboard in a search box. So you type something in, it sends it to the server, and every time you type a letter, it sends it to the server, which isn't very efficient. 
So you want to improve this and you add a debounce operator. What that does is just wait a certain period of time before sending the last result. Doing this, you can actually then take the original stream, subscribe to it, and return a new stream with only results um, after a certain amount of time. Reactive programming has a lot of operators. Too many to actually list out here. But it's got operators for transforming the data that comes back. Your maps that you would actually use in Java streams are fairly similar to the reactive programming ones. Uh, filtering, uh, combining stuff. Error handling. Error handling is quite nice in reactive programming. You just say retry when a message fails. So you call something from the server, execute a HTTP request, it fails, you just put in a retry, as long as it's a get request and not a post request, and you're good to go. So, as I said, um, it's been around for 39 years. Another way of thinking about reactive programming is through spreadsheets, if you're not familiar with it. So you've got a cell with a value, and you've got, say, th a few formulas referenced in that cell. When you go and update that cell, all those formulas magically update with a new value. What happened there was the cell just pushed out its new value, and everything subscribing on it or observing on that updated its own internal state uh, to show the correct data. Reactive programming is very useful for async operations, things that use network or things that use disk. Um, it embraces the idea of pure functions. So all of these operators expect a method passed into it or a function, and that function is supposed to be a pure function so that when you are working with all these events happening at different times on a stream, you can reliably, reliably predict what is going to happen because state isn't being modified while you're working through that stream. It's also another way to make concurrency fairly easy. Multiple threads, spinning out events, pop it onto one stream, process it as if it's a single thread. Some of the downsides of reactive programming are the amount of concepts. Hots are called observables, subjects or observers. Um, the need to add lots of, lots of functionality into your methods that you're passing into your operators. And one thing to note is that when you're using reactive programming, you don't actually just get a reactive system. Using one does not give the other, but it can enable the other. Let's show you an example of maybe some bad uh, use of reactive programming. So there was this navigation bar, and it had a title, an icon, and a search box. Um, each page that, na uh, that was rendered, this is an Angular application, by the way, uh, each place that rendered would take in this navigation service and pop, pop in its own title and turn on the search box with the search data. The problem here was when you navigated to a new page, if that new page didn't disable it or the previous page didn't disable the search box, you'd still have a search box there that would reference data that's already been um, disposed of or should have been disposed of. Um, the reason for using subjects and observables in this case is that subjects are more like a setter per se, on a stream. So with subjects, you can push data into a stream, and observers are your getters of that stream, where you can only listen to the data from the stream. So there was a good pattern of subjects and observers, and the observers were shared outside. The problem here is that there was a subject of a subject of a string. And that in itself is because the, the user trying to to write this, wanted the search box to be provided by the component on it to search for on the navigation bar back to itself, and that also produced rather erratic results. Um, talking about the allure of right and long functions, um, there was a list of pin items, and I've actually had to truncate all the items in there because it was a huge, uh, was it, 50 or not 50, 20 line method that was manipulating state outside and mapping it. It was, it was called with the map function, but it actually did a lot more than just mapping. Then there was a take one, which says, give me only one item from the stream and filter that out. So one quick problem looking at this was 
besides all the state being modified and the long methods not knowing what's happening, if that filter didn't return true, you wouldn't ever get any more items from that stream. It would cut off there, and all the state modification you were expecting here would break and fail. Last one I want to talk about is microservices, which is another important skill tool that you might have. Also, quite a buzz keyword nowadays. I'm sure you've all heard of it or seen it. This is an example of a microservice for, microservice for an online shopping place. Take a lot or eBay. You've got your service layer and individual microservices that provide specific functionality that they know how to handle well with their own databases. Microservices have been around for seven years, much shorter than all the other times, but it does use functionality or concepts in service-oriented architecture that's been around for at least 20 years. The idea behind them is that you have these services that can be written and maintained in isolation without affecting other parts of code. And then you can deploy this code, and if it runs slowly, you can scale it with also not having to scale up your whole monolith. Um, a downside, perhaps, of microservices is that it's quite hard to test um, when you've got all these different microservices interacting at different points in time. Um, they also talk to each other through the network, so there's a bit of overhead and possibility of having to retry, Q-reactive, um, the, the message so that you actually have reliable uh, data getting sent through. Here's a small treasure map of a microservice. Um, the same account or online store, but it looks bad, and I didn't even want to redraw it because as bad as it looks, as bad as it was. There, there were all microservices that were implemented, and they all used the same database. This is firstly a big no-no for microservices, because if you want to change the data or uh, migrate the data or even change the schema, you have to th find or think about all the other services that are using that same database or schema and worry about that. Definitely not the point of microservices. Then there was a reminder service that was badly named. Um, reminders of what items left in cart, of outstanding payments. The microservices themselves should be named properly so that you know what function they are trying to do. Here's a small flowchart on whether you need a microservice, and it's, it's definitely tongue in cheek. So the idea is don't start off with a microservice. If you're building a new product, monoliths are still the way to go. They have served as well, and microservices solve a specific problem. If you have large teams and you want that work to be done, split it out into microservices so each team can work on their own portion and deploy that portion. Good use case. You have performance issues. The app isn't, isn't, isn't performant. Split out the parts of the app, the processing of the app that you need into a microservice and spin up more instances of that. So the question I ask myself is, why do we see some of these bad examples in our workplace? And short answer is that there's no silver bullet, but I want to try and break this down into three core problems, or three problems that I think exist and cause this kind of issue. First problem is the cell phone problem. That trusty Nokia 3310? Yes, when I was in school, I got that phone, and I was super chuffed with it. Went around running, showing all my friends, hey, I can play Snake on a, a phone, look at your Sony Ericsson's now. And the, the problem there was I kind of continued doing that as soon as I was fresh out of varsity. I started working, and they were using GWT, and I'm like, we must use Ember. Ember is the way to go. And it is so awesome, it can do everything we do in GWT, it's on the web. Then my team came back to me and they're like, have you used it before? I'm like, no, no, I just read the documentation, it looks good. No, have you used it? And no, I hadn't used it, and I was recommending something that I had no experience in. And that is one of the problems that I see. People recommending or using things 
without fully understanding the impact or haven't used it in enough places. So how do you solve or prevent or counteract this cell phone problem? One way is to actually re do a bit of research and use it for yourself. Go write a pet project and try it out. See if it actually does what you think it can do. And, excuse me, if you can, take others along for the journey. Don't make it an isolated experimentation. If you have the possibility, talk to your team and say, I want to try out microservices or the cloud or AI. Find a part of your app that you can isolate and explore this concept together so that everyone gains the understanding. And if it fails, you still have the original part that you can fall back on. Um, you must accept that not everything can actually be um, ac uh, taken into it, or rather, except that not everything can be adopted in your workplace. For example, Gulp. Gulp was awesome, it was the, all, all the craze, and now it doesn't even exist anymore. Everyone's back to using NPM. And make sure to stay current with your technologies. ES9 is already out, Python 3 has been out for, what's it, over 10 years, and people still have Python 2 apps that are gonna get their end of life next year. The next problem I've seen is the magician problem. Now that guy looks pretty cool, conjuring up some, some weird thing, but we do the same in the workplace with our code. We go and write this awesome function that does magic, but no one understands it, and you haven't really benefited anyone by writing this. You went and used functional programming because you actually had an understanding of what it is, but you didn't take the time or effort to explain it to everyone and do it in the code. What happens? Once you're off the project, or someone actually needs to refactor that portion of code, they delete it because they don't know what it's doing, or if it was even beneficial and lost us the work. So, main point here is don't try to be a rock star. It's all good and great, but you need to work together with your team. If you're working by yourself as a one-man team, sure, go write any kind of code you like and make it so that you understand it, but also understand that no one else will take that code up afterwards and use it. Work towards elevating your team's knowledge. As, as with the other people, or with the previous example of taking people along for the journey, here you've done the journey, you've embarked on it, you've gained that knowledge. Don't keep it to yourself or just use it for attention. Try help your team as well. Um, don't hide that code also behind, um, what's the name, uh, utility functions or libraries or frameworks, because that's also not helping people. If you think it's maybe grunt workish, help the, or show the people on your team why is it a grunt work and what your code is doing, so that if it needs to be maintained, it can be. One of the worst examples I've heard for like these magicians out there, is they, they sort of know what they're doing, and when you ask for help, they say, no, go read a book. And I, I, I don't think that is the best approach. Rather, take the person, sit them down, and explain through it. Last problem is the veteran problem. No, it's not his foot, which seems weirdly out of place. It's a guy that's been around, and not specifically an old guy in the software development realm. Someone that has been using a tool for a certain amount of time and gained confidence in it, um, and now wants to use it everywhere. This is actually where the talk is based around, and it's a, a cognitive bias. Just want to take you through a short example of uh, biases and how it works. So I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the, the 26 or 246 experiment, but I'm gonna need some audience interaction. So hopefully I get some. We'll see how well this goes. Um, here's three numbers, and these three numbers represent a pattern. A pattern I have 
pre-thought out or actually just borrowed from the experimenters who, who made this. I've modified it slightly in case audience, mem audience members knew the original problem. Um, what I want is for people to try and figure out the pattern. And in order to do that, they need to provide me with three numbers that they think matches the pattern or doesn't match the pattern to figure out what the pattern is. So, 246 matches the pattern. Can I get another three numbers? Anyone? So, sorry? It is, it is a bit of a trap. It, 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 it's an experiment that's been done reliably uh, quite a few times, so... So 10, 16, and 26 yeah. it matches the pattern. Okay, so so. So so I, I won't repeat uh, the full pattern that uh, Gerard explained, but it's not the pattern isn't Fibonacci. Um, any maybe more triplets to try attempt and guess what the pattern might be. Yeah, 8, 10, 8, 10, 12. Also matches the pattern. Yep. Yeah. 1, 2, and 3 doesn't match the pattern. Cool. I'm going to tell you what the pattern is and tell you why this experiment works pretty much every time. So out of all the examples, well, the few examples that there were, most of my answers to that pattern was yes. The pattern itself was all the numbers should be even or odd in ascendant order. Fairly simplistic pattern. The original experiment only required that numbers be in ascendant order without specifying even or odd. And most of the responses or um, supplied triplets got the answer yes because people tend to provide examples that match their own internal cognitive bias, or, and that's called the confirmation bias. So not often will you hear responses to this, if you pose this to your friends even, um, where the answer is no. Because people look at the pattern, come up with their own solution, and provide examples that match that solution. And as soon as they have an example that matches that, they feel like they've got the pattern, or that they've um, gotten information out and this actually affects us with software testing because when you're testing, you don't actually test for negative examples. And testing for negative examples is actually the quickest way to figure out the pattern instead of testing for positive examples. So that was the confirmation bias. There's two other biases that I think can be relevant here. The priming bias. This bias is when someone presents information to you, your team lead or your manager or me right now in this talk. Individuals are more open to take those ideas and accept them as true without actually evaluating them. So think carefully about everything I've said and check up on it. Then there's the law of instrument, which is the one I opened up with, and that is familiarity in a tool um, tricks your brain into thinking that this tool can solve everything. And you end up using that tool time and time again, or forcing that tool, and sort of making it work, but not quite getting it right. Now, preventing cognitive biases is really hard. In fact, there's no scientific, 100% guaranteed way of stopping a bias. Um, one way that they've suggested is just being aware of biases, that biases exist is a good first step towards mitigating that bias. Um, breaking out of your comfort zone if you end up falling for the law of instrument is another good way of um, challenging your ideas if you're using the right tool. And treat your juniors with respect. When they come with the ideas of this new technology that they may not have researched that well, don't shoot them down instantly. Be kind to them and tell them why they need to research it more and maybe consider for yourself if you have not 
become too comfortable with your own tulin. So in conclusion, don't ever stop learning. Be aware of the fact that there's biases and all the reasons I've shown might account for them, but probably don't. Any questions? So the question was, for, for the initial examples um, with some of the pitfalls, is it only applicable to Java or does it also apply to C Sharp? So yes, most of them apply to C Sharp. There are a few nuances, but these pitfalls exist regardless of the language because of the fact that they're concepts in and of themselves. There's also additional pitfalls in languages that don't exist in these concepts because of the languages not supporting them out the box and having to sort of emulate that functionality. So how do you find the right tool for the right job? How do you find the right tool for the right job? So experiment and try out different things. There's always value to be gained in learning something. You might never use functional programming in your workplace. You're never going to work with numbers. You're only working with GUIs, for instance. It's, there's still value to be gained by knowing what you get by not mutating state. What value does it provide? So having more experience or more knowledge gives you a wider range of tool sets that you can then use and apply at different points in time. Cool, I think I've run out of time. Oh, to another question up there. Yes. Efficiency concerns. So there I can't comment since when functional programming came out in Java, I didn't use it. But I don't think it's that heavy since Java's garbage collector is pretty, pretty efficient and has actually beaten C++ on some occasions. So I wouldn't worry too much about efficiency. And may maybe just a, quite, uh, a quick digression. When worrying about performance, don't worry about it until you have that performance issue. It's always a good stance to take. Don't try optimize a piece of code if it hasn't failed you yet. Implement it in a way you understand and in a way that works. First, get it to work, get it into, get it running, and if it's slow, then, then optimize. Cool, that's me. <laughs>